evening. And first, what about Austin's Comet? Well, it hasn't been very bright in the evening sky, but it has been there. And here's an early April photograph of it, taken by Robert Forrest at the Hatfield Polytechnic Observatory. And there's the nucleus of the comet in the middle, and you can see the long, thin tail, stretching away at an angle of, um, well, about 10 o'clock, reckoning on a clock face. We hope the comet is going to get very much brighter than that, and I'll say more about it later on in the programme. Meanwhile, the sun has been coming up to the peak of its 11-year cycle of activity. And this photograph was taken on March the 20th by Douglas Arnold. And, of course, that's not an ordinary photograph. It was taken in hydrogen light, and that's why the sun appears red. And on that, the sunspots are darkish, and the active areas are bright. Well, shortly afterwards, I made a drawing of the sunspots with my own telescope, and you can see quite a number of spot groups there. But obviously, I didn't look at the sun direct. If I'd done that, I would have blinded myself. What I did was to use my telescope as a projector and send the sun's image through onto a screen and then draw the screen. Of course, the peak of activity is going to extend for several months yet. Above all, this is the week of the Hubble Space Telescope, the 94-inch reflector due to be launched from the Space Shuttle next Tuesday. Operating from above the Earth at a height of something like 300 miles, it should be far more effective than any telescope can ever be from the Earth's surface, and it should improve our knowledge tremendously. And, of course, when we know whether or not all has gone well, I'll be able to tell you more about it. Meanwhile, let's turn now to our main topic for this evening. Despite all the space shots, there's still a great deal to be seen in the sky with the naked eye or binoculars or with small telescopes. By now, we are losing the brilliant winter stars. For example, we've almost lost Orion, but there's still plenty around. And I want to talk this evening about some of the constellations of the zodiac, beginning with Leo the lion and Cancer the crab. So let's start by finding Leo. And that is quite easy. We begin, as we so often do, with Ursa Major, the Great Bear, the Plough, whichever you call it. And I think most people can recognise that. And they'll also know the pointers, which are on the right-hand side of the diagram here, just by the U in Ursa Major. And they point upwards to the North Star, Polaris, which lies very close to the North Celestial Pole. Now, to find Leo, what you do is to use the pointers the wrong way, and away from the Pole Star, and that leads us down to the celestial lion, which is quite easy to find. The brightest star is Regulus, considerably brighter than the pole star, and that curved line of stars, shaped rather like the mirror image of a question mark, is what we call the sickle of Leo. And the rest of the constellation consists of a triangle of stars further over to the left, so Leo is quite bright. Now, our second zodiacal constellation, Cancer, the crab, is by no means so obvious. And to use it, I always use a large triangle, beginning with Regulus, and then using the twins, Castor and Pollux, which are both fairly bright and lie very close to each other in the sky. Now, Gemini, the twins, is also in the zodiac, and at the present moment, it's dominated by the presence of the planet Jupiter, which is far brighter than any other star or planet, and in fact, brighter than anything in the sky, apart from the sun and the moon, and the planet Venus, which is now visible in the east before sunrise. So there's Jupiter. Now, one of the last remaining members of Orion's retinue is Procyon in the little dog. And that makes up the third of our triangle. And Cancer, the crab, lies inside that triangle, Regulus, Pollux, Procyon. But uh, beware, on this picture, Cancer looks very much more prominent than it actually is. In fact, his stars are very faint, and we've had to exaggerate them here, otherwise they wouldn't have shown up clearly on your screen. But Cancer is so dim that moonlight will drown it, and so will mist. So uh, don't, be, uh, don't expect to see anything startling. But Leo is very much finer. In mythology, Leo was a huge Nemean lion, killed by Hercules during one of his twelve labours. And if you've got enough imagination, I suppose you can see vaguely the outline of an animal there. And certainly the brightest star, Regulus, is often known as the Royal Star. But this is what it actually looks like in the sky. And this is a photograph taken by Ron Arbor. And Regulus quite clearly stands out at the bottom of the sickle. Now, Regulus is a hot white star, about 130 times as powerful as our sun, and is 85 light years away. Now, that means that we are seeing it as it used to be 85 years ago. Because it's light, moving at 186,000 miles per second, 
has taken 85 years to get there. And conversely, if there were anyone living in the system of Regulus, they would see the sun as it used to be 85 years ago. Now, we send out radio waves from the Earth, but we hadn't started doing so in 1905. And therefore, if there is anyone in the Regulus system, which, frankly, I doubt, because Regulus isn't really that kind of star, they would not yet have been able to pick up our radio waves, and to them, we would still be radio quiet. Then, of course, if you come into a much closer star, such as Sirius and the Great Drog, we would then be radio noisy. Well, Regulus is the brightest star on the sickle, and the second brightest is called Algeba. And Algeba is of the second magnitude, that's roughly the same as the pole star. And with the naked eye, it looks perfectly ordinary. But if you use a telescope, you'll find it's not. It is a double star. And that was a sketch I made a couple of nights ago with a three-inch refractor. And you can see that Algeba is made up of two. The brighter member is slightly orange, and the fainter member is white. And they really are connected. They form what's called a binary pair, and they're moving together round their common centre of gravity. But they don't do it very quickly. They take, in fact, over 600 years to make one rotation. So um, don't expect much change in Algeba during a lifetime. Now, the third brightest star in Leo is Denebola in the lion's tail, the brightest member of that little triangle. And it's, that's interesting because now it's of the second magnitude, almost exactly equal to Algeba. But according to the ancient astronomers of a couple of thousand years ago, Denebola was equal to Regulus of the first magnitude. So either there's some mistake in either interpretation or translation, or else the old astronomers were simply wrong, or else Denebola has deliberately faded. Now, in point of fact, there are one or two of these secular variables around. For example, it was once said that in the twins, Pollux was fainter than Castor, and it's now brighter. But personally, I very much doubt if there has been any change in Denebola. It isn't that kind of star. It's um, a perfectly ordinary white star, about 18 times as luminous as our sun, and there's no reason why it should change over a short period. But all the same, it is um, a minor mystery, and it's rather interesting. But if Denebola is not variable, there's one star in Leo that quite definitely is. In fact, there are plenty, but this particular one is the brightest of them. It's called R. Leonis, and it's not very far away from Regulus in the sky. You won't see it with the naked eye, you will see it with binoculars, and of course the telescope shows it well, and it's very red, it's a red giant. And it's close to that star labelled 18, and you may wonder, why 18? Well, in fact, all the stars of naked eye brightness have got their numbers, and these were given by the first Astronomer Royal, John Flamsteed, who began his work at the Royal Greenwich Observatory way back in 1675. And he allotted these numbers, and um, this particular star was 18 in his catalogue of Leo. It's um, on the fringe of naked eye visibility, I say binoculars show it easily. And uh, when I looked at R. Leonis a couple of nights ago, it was just marginally fainter than 18. But at minimum, R. Leonis goes down to the tenth magnitude, and then, of course, you need a telescope to see it. And this is what's called a long period star, with a period of 312 days. That's to say, the interval between one maximum and the next. But it is very red, and in fact, it's a good deal uh, more brilliant than Betelgeuse and Orion. But of course, it's a great deal further away, and that's why it appears so much fainter. Also in Leo, we find a couple of galaxies. They're called M65 and M66, and they're generally near the lion's tail. And the M stands for Messier, because these were number 65 and 66 in a famous catalogue of star clusters and nebulae, drawn up way back in the year 1781 by Charles Messier. And there's a picture of these two spirals. And uh, they are genuinely connected. Mind you, they're something like 180,000 light years apart, but they're around 29 million light years away. So they're certainly are not on our doorstep. You can just about see them with binoculars. I admit that I always find them difficult, but you can do it. A small telescope shows them well, although obviously to see their spiral form, you do need a photograph taken with a big telescope. So there's plenty to see in Leo, but not so much, I am bound to say, in Cancer, apart from a couple of really interesting objects. Remember, Cancer lies inside that big triangle formed by Regulus in Leo, the twins, and Poussin in Canis Minor. And Cancer looks a little bit like a very dim and distorted Orion. 
Frankly, I find it very difficult to make the outline of a crab out of cancer or anything else. In mythology, cancer was a crab sent by the goddess Juno to plague the hero Hercules. And Hercules, not unnaturally, trod on it, and that was the end of the crab. But the uh, stars are pretty dim. The uh, leader is Acubens, or Alpha Cancerae. And note also the two stars known as the Asses, Acellus Borealis and Acellus Australis. And they're known as the Asses, but they lie to either side of a famous open star cluster, which is known as Pisipi, or M44. But Pisipi is sometimes called the Manger, and hence the Asses. Now, this photograph was taken by Bernard Abrams, and it shows the two asses there. You can see them near the middle of the picture. You can see the blur of Pisipi, and down further to the left, you can see Acubens. But Pisipi itself is one of the best open clusters in the entire sky. It's number 44 in Messier's catalogue, and although haze will hide it, and certainly moonlight will, on a clear, dark night, it's perfectly obvious. And this Ron Arbor photograph shows it very well. But frankly, I always think that the best way to see Pisipi is to look at it with binoculars, because it covers quite a wide area, and if you use a telescope, even with a fairly low power, your field of view is not going to be big enough to get the entire cluster in. So in my view, binoculars are the best bet. And there's also a second open cluster in Cancer on the fringe of naked eye visibility, and that is M67 in the same binocular field with Acubens. And that's a rather different kind of cluster. This photograph, again taken by Bernard Abrams, shows it very well. Uh, Acubens is just out of the field to the left-hand side of your picture here. But the interesting thing about M67 is that it appears to be a very old cluster by cosmic standards. Most open clusters are young, with their main stars hot and blue and energetic. Certainly that's the case with the most famous open cluster in the sky, the Pleiades or Seven Sisters. But M67 is an older cluster, and it does contain a number of red stars, which are fairly old. And quite apart from that, there's one very red star in Cancer. It's known as X Cancerae. It's not very far away from Pisipi, and it really looks like a glowing coal. And that's also another variable star, with a magnitude range of from 5.5 to 7.5, so you can't really see it with the naked eye, but with binoculars you can, and it certainly is worth looking at. So there we have Cancer, not a very imposing constellation, but I think redeemed by the presence of those two open clusters, Pisipi and M67. Now our next zodiacal constellation is again more conspicuous, and this is Virgo the Virgin. And this is a large constellation, which you'll see below Leo. It's one of the largest constellations in the entire sky, though I wouldn't say it's particularly imposing. There don't seem to be any really well-marked mythological legends attached to it, although sometimes Virgo is equated with the Earth goddess Ceres. The brightest star, by far, is the first magnitude Spiker, which is a bright, white, hot star, more than 2,000 times as luminous as our sun, and 230 light years away. And it's actually a very close double star, but the components are so close that you can't separate them with an ordinary telescope. Now, the second interesting star is Erich in the bowl of the Y of Virgo. And uh, that really is an interesting double star. And this is what it looked like in the sky. This photograph by Ron Arbor shows Erich in part of the bowl, and near the top of the picture there, over on the right-hand side, you can see it in nebula in Leo. But what about Erich itself? Well, you can find it quite easily, and uh, to the naked eye, it looks perfectly normal. But in fact, it's made up of two components which are exactly equal. They are perfect stellar twins. And uh, when I first looked at them, when I was a boy of 12, with my three-inch telescope, Erich was one of the widest and easiest double stars in the entire sky. And that was the drawing I made of it way back in 1935. Now, earlier on this week, I made another drawing using the same telescope and the same eyepiece. And now, Erich looks like that. And with a small telescope, it's none too easy to separate. And you might imagine from that that the two stars are getting closer to each other. In fact, they're not. Like all binaries, the two components are moving together around their balancing point, or common center of gravity. And because the two components are exactly equal, the center of gravity, or balancing point, is midway between them. And we fixed up a model here in the studio to show exactly what happens. Here we have the two components on stalks. There we have the bar joining them. And in the middle, the pivot around which they're moving. 
Now, as we move them round, you can see what's happening. We are now seeing them from a less favourable angle, and the two stars appear to be getting closer to each other. In fact, they're not. They're exactly the same distance apart. But we are now seeing them from a narrower angle, and they're getting closer and closer. And by the year 2016, they will apparently be so close together that even a large telescope will find it difficult to show them separately. And after that, they'll open up once more. Of course, it's a slow process. The revolution period of the two Arishes is just over 171 years. Now let's come back to Virgo and have another look at that area which I call the Bowl. That's the region between Venebola in Leo and Arich uh, in the constellation itself. And in that area, we find many galaxies, of which the leader is M87, a huge elliptical system with a curious jet coming out of it, very much larger and more massive than our galaxy, and possibly with a black hole right in the middle. And M87 is the leading member of the Virgo cluster of galaxies. And that includes hundreds of members. And when you look at that picture, it takes an effort to realize that some of those dim, misty blurs are, in fact, huge star systems containing more than 100,000 million suns. You won't see many of the Virgo cluster members with a small telescope, but you can see some of them as dim patches. As I say, it really is a very populous cluster indeed. So there's a great deal to see in Virgo. And all in all, the spring skies are by no means devoid of things to look at. And the lion and the crab and the virgin give us plenty of opportunity. But now, let me come back once again to Austin's Comet. As I've said, it's not been a prominent evening object, but it has been seen and photographed. And here's a drawing made in early April by Paul Doherty. And once again, you can see there the tail stretching away at an angle of about 10 o'clock. Now, here is the track shown from March through to May. And as you can see, in April now, it's been coming up through the constellation Aries the Ram in the general direction of the square of Pegasus. And this is the position on April the 9th, below the little constellation of Triangulum. And it'll then track up, and by the 29th, it's going to be above the square of Pegasus. And then you will see it in the morning sky. About an hour before sunrise, look over into the east, where the sun is about to rise, and there you should see the comet with quite an imposing tail. It's always dangerous to make forecasts, but I still think that Austin's comet may be quite a sight, so do look out for it. And the track is also given in our newsletter, and the newsletter is now ready. And if you want it, send your stamp with envelope to Newsletter 37, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London, W12, 7RJ, or if you like, look at CFAX, page 616. So let's hope for the best of Walston's Comet. Until next month, good night. <laughs>